This conference will now be recorded. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Oceanside Library this afternoon. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce our presenter this afternoon, Fran Cohen. She uh, runs books dis book discussions and lectures for us at the Oceanside Library, and we're so lucky to have her online with us today for her to bring her wonderful programs to us. So Fran, thank you for being here today with us. Welcome. Delighted. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to my kitchen. Uh, you may notice it says Ed Cohen on the uh, screen. Uh, that's my husband, and he's my fantastic assistant. Uh, he will be helping us with the visual effects, which will happen later. Uh, for those who know me, uh, you usually see me in a book discussion setting, but I also, as you see here, do different kinds of programming, uh, lectures, presentations, workshops, dealing with theater, dealing with film, dealing with books, dealing with fun. So uh, in general, anytime you would come to a presentation, I spend a good five minutes or so just offering you suggestions on the cultural scene. Um, obviously, we can't be running to theater and we can't be going to concerts, uh, but it seems that the world has decided to come to us. So I'm going to um, offer a number of suggestions that you might want to make note of. Um, if you have a pen and paper handy, that will be very helpful. Um, and then I will share some of the adventures I've been having over the past few weeks. First of all, I do want to shout out to the libraries. As Ocaria has just said, many libraries all across Long Island are offering you extraordinary programming that you literally, if you care to, be online with your library's programming all day, all night. There are so many opportunities to explore. If you can't obviously get physically to the library, you can take books out online. They have Overdrive, they have Hoopla, they have uh, Canopy. You can listen to books on tape, you can list, uh, see them on your e-reader. Uh, there's just so many ways to take advantage of what's out there, particularly from uh, the libraries. So um, as you are obviously doing, do, do continue to do that. So over the past month, a number of things uh, have come up for me that I wanted to share. Um, in March, on the, the issue is the 23rd, uh, Time Magazine came out with a celebration of the 100 years of um, the women's vote. And what they decided to do was look back on the past 100 years and recreate all their covers with a representation of an amazing woman. So in this instance, as you see, it's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And if you go through the Time Magazine, and you could possibly get it online through your libraries, you will be able to see gorgeous, not just photographs, collages, paintings, different ways of media putting together um, the faces of these fantastic women that have often been left out of history or not been lauded as much as they should have. So see if you can take a, a look at that. You would really, really enjoy it. Um, obviously, we're doing a lot of reading if, if we're comfortable to do that in this time. Uh, it's a difficult time and people have very mixed emotions and whatever your emotions are, they're all good. Um, recognize them and, and live with it and then continue on. Uh, so one of the new books I recently read, which I was very impressed with, is called Dear Edward, and it's by Anne Napolitano. And the premise doesn't sound like something you may want to read at this time because it's really a very difficult story. It's the story of a young boy who is the only survivor of a plane crash. And you would say, oh my God, why would I want to be reading that at this point in time? The answer is actually, it's a beautiful story, incredibly well written. And it's the story of his survival. It's the story of how one gets through a horrific experience. And it's not all tears. It's, it's really 
very passionate and very personal. And part of uh, part of the story is his story and how he recovers. And another part of the story is what happened on the plane. So you're very uh, engaged in the story. It reads like a mystery. Um, it, it's a very fast read and it's very well done. So I recommend if you're looking for a new book to read to check out Dear Edward by Anne Napolitano. Fran, if I can just interrupt for one yeah. second. Barbara, um, I can't seem to turn your camera off. So do you mind turning your camera off so that um, Fran is the only one that is on the screen? I'm so sorry, I'm having trouble. It won't let me um, turn your camera off. Sometimes it does. Thank you so much. Thank you and thank you for coming. Go ahead, Fran. Hi, Barbara, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we may not be in the mood to actually sit and read. We may not be able to keep ourselves that quiet. Uh, so what I often enjoy are audiobooks, and I also enjoy listening to books on CD. And when we had opportunity to scoot out into the city, I would very frequently go to Symphony Space uh, on the Upper West Side. And what they have, they have many things, but the one that I was always attracted to was something called Selected Shorts. And that would be an evening of famous actors performing famous short stories. So you have in the audience all the authors and you have in the audience, all, I mean, well, on stage, all the actors. And it's just charming and delightful and so much fun and it, you're watching performance. Well, the exciting thing is that Symphony Space is offering that to you free at home. All you need to do is log on to their website and give them your email. And every Sunday, they will send you a short story read by an amazing actor. And we've enjoyed them tremendously. They've been a, a pure pleasure, uh, 45 minutes more, most likely, and you're just totally transported. So I truly recommend that if it's of interest to you. Um, another is a, a website that I recently discovered, and it's called Amava, A-M-A-V-A dot com. And it's a website which may not sound as if you can utilize it this minute, because the concept is discover your next, meaning what else do I want to do in this day? What else do I want to do in this life? And they offer you incredible opportunities to explore um, travel, well, not this moment, travel, um, community organizations, um, helping others, volunteering work. Uh, it's just a comp compilation of many, many opportunities to play with, to say, okay, I have this time, what do I want to do next? And as they evolved with the time, what's happening now is they're giving you uh, insight and opportunity of things you can do right this minute. Um, I also was very flattered to be invited to be a guest contributor to it. So if you go on the site um, under guest contributors, you will find my name, it's Fran Cohen, not Ed. And um, I have an article called uh, Selections or Suggestions from a Professional Reader. And you might find some ideas of things to read and things to do on that as well. Okay, and just one more thing. Um, I love theater as many of us do. And there are a number of opportunities to see live performances. And the one that I'm most excited about is from the National Theater in London. And they have made available many of their performances online. They come on Thursday and you have the whole week to see them. Many of them could be two, three hours long. So you may not want to do it all in one sitting. And they've had Jane Eyre. They've had uh, Treasure Island. And starting today, they will have Twelfth Night. So I believe that um, all the websites that I've mentioned are uh, will be posted on this chat so everybody can uh, Take a look at it if you need it. Um, also, later on in the discussion, which I will get to in a minute, um, I have a list of questions that are on my website 
that you may want to think about when you look at comparing books to film. And my website is bookfran.com and it will be in the newsletter section. Okay, that's the beginning. <laughs> All right, what we're going to be talking about today is the concept of transformation of literature, of books, of stories, of memoirs, of biography. I know this is labeled fiction, but I'm also including nonfiction uh, to film and a comparison. We're going to look at, for the most part, many of us may read a book and love the book and hug it to us and say, oh, this is phenomenal. I, I would wonder what it would be like in a movie. And then later on, we find that it's actually made into a movie. And we're very excited for that. And we go see the movie. And more often than not, we're disappointed. It's not what we thought. It's not what we expected. It's not how we envisioned this story to happen. And so what I wanted to do today, particularly because we are predominantly staying at home and spending more time online than we ever have, and perhaps looking at film that uh, we may not have had opportunity to see before. We're streaming more than ever. So I wanted to uh, look at the concept of what happens when a book becomes a film, and why is it that we might be disappointed? Um, so in general, my objective for you is to come away understanding a little bit more about the process of books and the process of movie making and respecting each for its own purposes. Um, the first thing I would suggest to you when a book is made into a film is to have no expectations that anything about the book will actually come out in the movie. I have story after story of disappointed authors and disappointed people who expected one thing and got something totally else. So what I want to suggest to you is to have as few expectations as possible, although that's not really possible. We want it to be everything we envisioned it to be. And respect that they're two very different media. The book creation or the reading of a book is very personal. It's you and the author, and it's your imagination and your mind and the author sharing his or her guts in a way, his or her story that you see, if you're a visual learner, that you see as you're reading. So you've already cast the movie, you've already set the scenery, you've already know the location. And so when we come to a film and it's not what we thought, it can be very disappointing. So the co collaboration of you and the author is very personal and it's one-on-one. -on -one. What's different when you come to the making of a movie is that it is a collaboration times a hundred. There could be a thousand people involved in filmmaking. There can be tons of different perspectives on what the film should be. So it's extremely collaborative and there's multiple factors which impact the making of a film. So what we want to do is look at each as an autonomous work. It's very rare that we're totally satisfied with the movie version of a book you love. Um, I can probably count on 10 fingers all the books that I have felt were exactly as I experienced it as I read. Uh, just reflecting back, um, Memoirs of a Geisha was pretty much everything the book was. Uh, the Remains of the Day, um, The Godfather, these are uh, titles that for me represented everything. So what we have to do is look at a film not as a cultural replacement for a story or a novel, but to view the adaptation as a variation on a theme. 
films must succeed on its own terms. Was it good or bad, not because it copied the book or was it exactly as you envisioned it? Um, or was it good or bad because it was faithful or unfaithful to the book? But was it good or bad because it's a good or bad film? In the best cases, an adaptation extends and enhances and elaborates on the source. So what I'm going to do now is give you a little bit of what I call the formal lecture of a variation on book to film. And then when I finish that, and it's only a few minutes long, uh, I'm going to um, open up for everyone. I'm going to be doing a comparison of four different movies or series that we have available to us right now. And some you may have seen and some perhaps not. I'm going to be talking about, so you may want to think about what your experience was in seeing these if you have, or reading it if you have. I'm going to be talking about Unorthodox, which was a memoir and it was made into a four part series for Amazon, I believe. I'm going to be talking about Little Women, which we've had iterations for generations of. I'm going to be talking about If Beale Street Could Talk, and both Little Women and Beale Street are available to stream. Um, and Unorthodox, as I mentioned, is on Amazon. And finally, I'm going to talk about one that was made into a TV series that's ongoing at the moment, and it's called The Council of Dads. So those are the four pieces I'll be highlighting, each for different reasons. And then um, when I open it up to you, I'd be happy to hear your response to um, those books or those films or anything else you care to share. Okay, the formal part. Find the glasses. When we think back onto film history or going all the way back many, many years ago, even before D.W. Griffith and his film, The Birth of a Nation, adapted from the Dixon's book, The Klansman, in 1915, directors were mining novels and plays for source material. But movies and books are often viewed as um, modes of storytelling, uh, but film is seen as a threat to the book because it may um, squash the commercial value. Uh, you go see the movies, you know, oh, I don't have to read the book, I just saw it. And in term, fiction is also accused of encumbering film because it needs to be made visual. So although they have this love-hate relationship it is something that is fairly constant. A novel contains as many versions of itself as it has readers, whereas the film's final cut vaporizes every other way of seeing it. Even when the novelist is on set or is the screenwriter, there's no guarantee that the film version will parallel the fiction. I mean, I have stories and stories about this. Um, a long time ago, in 1990, uh, Margaret Atwood's book, The Handmaid's Tale, which we now have a series on Hulu, I believe, uh, was made into a movie. And she was the screenwriter. And it was rated one of the worst movies ever made in Hollywood. And you go, how is that possible? It's an extraordinary book, and she's right there, and she's the screenwriter. And people said to her, how did you let that happen? And what she said is very telling. And this is part of the reason we can't necessarily have expectations that our reading experience is going to play out on the film. She said, the book was made on the cutting room floor, meaning the editing is what makes or breaks the movie. And you can have all the best actors in the world, all the best directors in the world, all the best set designers, everything else. But it is the film editing that makes the movie. I'll talk more about that later on. Um, even when the actor, I'm sorry, the authors are on set, there's a story of Jodie Picoult, who was uh, invited on set. She wasn't the screenwriter, but she was invited on set to um, overlook her book, My Sister's Keeper. Well, she was so upset with the ending 
she was so irate at how they twisted the ending to be something totally different from her book and what she expected that they threw her off set. She was literally banned from the set. And my favorite, and this is, um, I don't want to be making fun, but it, it feels like it should be made fun of. My favorite, I'll just read you a paragraph. This is from um, Ivy Singer, one of our extraordinary writers from the past century. He sold his short stories to different people for different purposes. And the one that we probably know best is Yentl, which was made by and for Barbara Streisand. So he had made a comment uh, or sent an article to the New York Times at that time. And this is what he said about the transformation of a book or story into film. Those who adapt novels or stories for the stage or for the screen must be masters of their profession and also have the decency to do the adaptation in the spirit of the writer. You cannot do the adaptation against the essence of the story or the novel, against the character of the protagonist. So he was not very happy with Barbara's interpretation of Yento, and that was because she sang. Yento wouldn't sing, and that's because she went to America. There was no reason for Yento to go to America. So, I mean, it just strikes me a little bit funny in that if you're selling a property at Barbara Streisand, most likely you're going to have singing in it, but that's the way it goes. So even the authors are not necessarily satisfied with what happens when their book is sold. <clears throat> the best line is from Gloria Naylor. If you remember her, she was the author of Women of Rooster Place, which uh, Oprah ultimately bought and made a film out of. She said, when I relearned that my book was sold, this is what you should do. You should meet in Las Vegas. Hollywood come to Las Vegas. She was coming from New York and go to Las Vegas. She said, you throw them the book and they throw you the money and you get out of town. So the concept is really, it's like when you send your children to college, you've given them 18 years of hopefully love and support and good advice and wisdom. And they come back another person <laughs> that once they leave you, it's another ball game. It's somebody else's story. So authors as well as readers have to accept that something else happens. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. While our mindset is that the book is always better, Hollywood still continues to look for books tied to a particular fan base. They know if there's a lot of readers, there's a potential movie um, audience out there. Uh, screenwriters continue to express the desire to stay true to the original work. A screenwriter's job is how to figure out how to take something that people read in over a week and do it in a hundred minutes. You have days and days of reading and you have to condense that to something very short. In the opposite way, if they take a short story such as uh, Brokeback Mountain, remember Annie Prue's story from many years ago? They can elaborate, they can expand because it's a short story and you make it anything you want. But in the most part, they are going to have to condense and reduce and get rid of and reframe everything they have in mind. I love this line. Film is a narrative in a hurry. It has to cut corners. Movies depend more on mood and atmosphere. It cannot even with montage and flashback and flash forward and jump cuts satisfactorily handle long tracks of time. Even with the technical mastery of um, the makeup artist and the costumer and the set designer, people don't usually age well in a film if you're going from a young person to an older one. It's the character's age is not necessarily convincing. Film adaptations can stimulate, they can enlighten, but unfortunately they can also infringe on your privilege of a reader as casting the parts, setting the scene, 
and playing out the narration yourself. A number of authors who had been invited on set and watched a film being made or, or later came to view their film realized that the characters on, on the film were not anything that they envisioned. And although they, for the most part, enjoyed who was cast in the parts they created, ever after, they only saw that particular actor. They no longer saw the, um, the, the actor or the, uh, the protagonist as they had envisioned it. The challenge of a film, of, cre of transferring book to film, is to change thoughts into words, emotions into gestures, and descriptions into actions. It equally must satisfy the reading audience and please the audience ignorant of the book. Since the 1940s, seven out of 10 of the best pictures that won the best picture awards were based on novels. That's an incredible uh, percentage. Film rarely does justice to good fiction. Movies have an apparent, apparently incorrigible tendency to sentimentalize, simplify, and sog up the source. And yet, on any good day, only 200, the, the uh, odds are 200 to 1 that a book can be um, bought and, and made into a movie. And sometimes it takes years. It, 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 often it takes 10 years before that actually happens. All movies are made at least three times, once in the writing, once on the set, and once in the editing room. And here's where I come into the concept that film is a collaboration. We know this, we see movies, we know all the people involved in it. You have producers and directors and screenwriters and actors and cinematographers, uh, production design, set design. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Costuming, stunt people, uh, musicians, camera people, location scouts. I mean, the list can be endless and endless. And yet, who has the say of what the story is supposed to be about? The other thing to think about is also the budget. Sometimes you have to condense the story because the budget won't allow it to be as broad as you would like it. So who creates this vision? Usually it's the director. The director is usually credited with the success or the failure of a film. And it is his or her vision that we are viewing. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. I'm sure many of us remember the best um, exotic marigold hotel. And that was based on a book by Deborah Mogash called These Foolish Things. It had a parade of directors, six exactly, over the course of its attempt to be filmed. Uh, the screenwriter was Old Parker, and he wrote 43 drafts for four different directors. It took him three and a half years revising the best exotic Marigold Hotel. He said it was a nightmare I never hoped to repeat, uh, repeat. Every director wanted something different. Every director had something else in mind. It was impossible. But ultimately, the fourth or the sixth director convinced him to stick it out. And uh, as we see, it was a very successful film. Every director has different styles. A movie is not about what it's about. It's about how it is about, which means a movie is not about a subject. A movie is about its style. And very often, if it's a cinematographer or a film director who knows his stuff, they are layering on film history. So there can be enormous amount, many, many versions of any one film because a different director has a different style. Or the actors are very different. Um, we have producers, and the role of the producer, and I'm quoting Nina Jacobson said, the most important thing to remember is what made you love the book. The movie can't and doesn't have to be just the book. You know, you couldn't, you cannot put a 12 hour film, well, some people do, but you can put a, 12, a book that took you 12 hours to read um, on film and you'd be bored to death uh, because one is interior and one is vis visual, but it should make you feel what the book made you feel. Um, 
film editors probably do the most work toward creating what you see up on the screen. And they're working quite separately from whatever the movie is about. They're just trying to get the image straight. So they don't care if the storyline really follows or if there are some errors uh, or uh, goofs or wrong timeline. They just want to make sure that the images are straight. So what I want to suggest to you in looking at film that was made for books is uh, to consider the following. What can one medium do that the other cannot? And does the film open <coughs> up new ways of seeing the book or thinking about the book? So I'm back to the concept of respecting what each individual artist or each medium is trying to achieve and to ask, um, did one satisfy you in a way that was different from the other? Okay, um, now I'd like to get to the films that I want to share. So I need my tech person back here, please. And what I'd like is to ask you to um, comment or share anything you want to uh, share uh, in reference to these books and movies that I'm going to talk about. Okay, let me get to Beale Street. <clears throat> uh, very recently, um, one of the most amazing books from last year, uh, not the book, I'm sorry, the film from last year is James Baldwin's If Beale Street Could Talk. I, I have, as you noticed, uh, the cover from the original, which I think was 1974, and then the uh, poster from the movie, which was, I believe, last year. Beautiful story incredibly written, incredibly rendered. Um, it's the story of love and the story of injustice. A young black man is falsely accused of a crime he did not commit and his family and his future bride, uh, they were about to be married, but unfortunately uh, he was arrested before that. Um, they're working on getting him out of jail and attempt for him to be uh, <coughs> to show his innocence. Uh, to add to that, she's pregnant and the family are okay with it. They knew they were in love. They knew they were going to be married. They knew they were going to be together forever. So it's a beautiful evocation on one hand of family caring and sharing and working through issues. And on the other hand, it's um, a very obvious depiction of Black Lives Matter where Unfortunately, in, in many, many instances, not just black, but in many, many instances, people are accused of crimes that they did not commit. Um, I would like to liken this to something a little more contemporary in terms of a novel that you may want to look at if you haven't, and it's called An American Marriage, and that's by Tiare Jones, and that came out about two years ago. Very similar story, a young couple in love, uh, in this case, they were married, and he's wrongfully accused of a crime and goes to jail. In this instance, and it's similar here as well, um, you know, will she wait for him? What can they do to get him out? So it's a similar kind of story. I have to admit, I hadn't read James Baldwin when he was very, when he was alive, when he was popular, when he was very successful. But coming to this book now, I was blown away. The language is extraordinary. So I just want to share with you um, what Barry Jenkins, who was the filmmaker and the um, director of this, Barry Jenkins, if you recall, won um, the Academy Award for Moonlight um, <clears throat> the year or two before. And um, he won numerous awards and accolades for his creative work. I had the good fortune of meeting him um, one of the things I like to do is get to see and talk to authors. And uh, this was at um, New York Reads Experience. And uh, he, he, If Beale Street was one of the books that New York was going to select for their reading experience for the year. Anyway, 
Barry said this, I wanted to make a movie that felt the way it feels to read James Baldwin. To me, it's the evocation, I'm sorry, the evocative nature of it. I think what he did so well in his prose was reflect the way our consciousness operates. I think our thought patterns um, are, are aligned. And when you read James Baldwin, he's not adhering to the restrictions of story format. Instead, he's sort of reflecting what it feels like to think and experience emotions. To me, there was no version of the film that didn't have Baldwin's voice in it as spoken through Tish, the young lady. So in this case, both the book and the film did justice to each other. I was very pleased with this rendition. Uh, does anyone care to comment or want to share about having seen this or would like to see this? Anyone have a thought, want to share anything about uh, if Beale Street could talk? Okay, I'll carry on. <laughs> we'll go to the next one. Is someone and just a reminder too that you can either unmute your mic and ma make a comment or you can write it in the chat, whatever you prefer. Okay. And I'll continue on and then perhaps when I'm finished with all of them, people will come on in general. So we can do that. All right, let's go to the next one then. Okay. This needs no introduction. I'm not going to reiterate the story of Little Women. We know it's four sisters. We know they're navigating through uh, life post-Civil War. And um, we've loved it for many, many years. This iteration, and I say that because there were, I think, six films made of Little Women. This iteration is done by Greta Gerwig, an amazing director. She did Lady Bird, if you remember, a few years back. Very true to its source. Um, the story is here, as we know and love the story. She fiddled a little bit with the ending. Um, and the one thing that made it, well, there were many things that made it very special and very unique. And I highly recommend you seeing it if um, you haven't done so already, is that it's, it has a feminist flavor, although Louise May Alcott had a feminist flavor even way back when. Um, the time frame has been juggled. You have flashbacks, you have flash forwards, and it creates a puzzle. So you as the viewer who would normally read the book and then expect a linear a creation of the movie is not finding that. You're going to go, wait a minute, what's happening now? So she's making you work a little, which is not a bad thing. It's great to keep you engaged. And um, the coloring, the cinematography, the scenery, the set design, beyond gorgeous. The acting superb. I mean, I found this to be an incredibly flawless movie. The updating uh, Joe, the main protagonist a bit, and the reimagining of Amy. Amy is usually one we dismiss, oh, the nasty kid, you know, that kind of thing. But here you see her in a different light. And uh, the performance is so extraordinary that you see she has much more heart and much more heat. So um, I truly recommend, again, this was a, a lovely uh, presentation. What I wanted to share too, and the reason I selected this, not only because it's a great book and a great movie, is to have you consider what other classics have been reimagined in film. And you have time and it's probably very easy to access without it costing anything. Uh, some of the old books and the old movies, you can do The Godfather, you can do The Mo uh, Mockingbird, you can do Gone with the Wind. Or if you have the patience, you can see six versions of Little Women. Okay, let's continue on. Oh wait, Fran, uh, we had one comment. Claire said okay. she found the movie visually striking, gorgeous scenery and costumes, and she hadn't read the book. So okay, 
Okay. Yeah, she just wanted to make that comment. You can love it without having read the book. It's, you know, each, as I said, you respect as an individual media. And if it prompts you to go to read the book, even better. I mean, sometimes I see a film first and then I scoot to the book. And what happens in a book, not only it's just that it's a personal thing, everything gets broadened where you see a character for a couple of minutes and you get a, a stick figure of what he is or isn't. In the book, you get his history, you get his background, you get his connection to the other people, you get his story. And that's what story is about, just adding, adding so much. And anytime I do a book to film discussion on a regular basis, and more often than not, um, what I share is that it's much meatier in the book, there's more detail in the book. Uh, there's more to play with in the book, even if it's true to uh, what the film has created. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, let's go on to the next. In the meantime, I'm going to mute everyone, but feel free when you do want to make a comment, you can unmute yourself, make the comment, and then mute yourself again. It just we, we're getting some background noise. That's the only reason okay. I'm doing that. But please, I encourage anyone who would like to talk to go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is the Council of Dads. And I selected this for a number of reasons um, because this is made into a TV series, which is ongoing. And it started a couple of weeks ago. So it's a different venue. It's not a film. It's not... Um, a short clip. It's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing series. So we don't know how it plays out in terms of how it will end, if it ends. Hopefully they'll be picked up and it continues on. But it's an example, and this, as I said, is made for TV, which is different. It's a regular channel as opposed to a streaming channel. Um, so it's an example of another way that contemporary writers and contemporary authors and contemporary filmmakers can take advantage of uh, good literature. So this is a memoir. It's written by uh, Bruce Filer. It's actually called, um, let's see, My Daughters, My Illness, and the Men Who Could Be Me. It's very moving, it's very poignant, and it's very funny. Bruce Filer is, an, is a writer. We may have remembered him from a number of years ago when he came out with the book, Walking the Bible, a very unique story. And he has been writing ever since. And a number of years ago, he unfortunately developed a uh, very bad cancer of his leg and they didn't know what was going to happen. He was married at the time, was still married and had twin daughters. And he started to think in terms of, oh my God, if I'm not here, not only will my daughters, they were very young at the time, they were three, I believe, not necessarily remember me, but know very little about me and they'll just hear a story here and there. So he got very creative and in his need to be known to his children, he decided to create what he called the Council of Dads. And in it, he invited six of his best buddies to be a surrogate father if at some point in life um, he is not here. And not just be a father to say, hey, I remember your dad and he was really great, but to represent a different aspect of him. So for his fun-loving side, he checked with one friend. For his serious side, he checked with another. For his writer's side, he checked with another, et cetera, and so on. So they would not necessarily move into his house and, and be with his children on a regular basis, but check in with them every now and then and remind them or be the guide or help them with anything that may, they may have encountered in life if he were not here to do it himself. So it's a stunning, stunning book. I truly, highly recommend reading it. I've had the pleasure of meeting him and he's extraordinary. He is one of the most vivacious, gregarious, um, energetic individuals I have ever met. I mean, this was many years ago when the book came out. I mean, he was so, so delicious. I, I had the nerve to go over to him and say, uh, 
I have two daughters, <laughs> which would be interesting. I mean, he was very gracious about it. Anyway, um, they've made a, a, a series, a TV series about it. And what they did was start with a premise. It's the same premise. It's a family, father becomes ill, and now what? He creates this council of dad. All that is the same. And then nothing else is the same. All they did was take the premise because the family in this story is um, a very multiracial, uh, a lot of kids involved. Um, and in the story, in the first uh, chapter or on the first uh, episode, the father dies, which fortunately did not happen. Bruce is fine, he's well, he's doing great. The kids are great, they're 15 at this point. And um, all is well on that front. So here is an example of getting an idea, taking a premise, and then going off in totally different directions. Um, I'll just give you another example of an extreme case of that. Um, I met a woman quite a few years ago named Susan Glass, who is a writer. And she just had published, was about to have published a book called The Interpreter. Now, some of us may remember that as a film uh, with Nicole Kidman, and it takes place at the UN. It's probably the only film that ever at that time had happened at the UN or that they allowed people in the UN to film. And if I recall correctly, and I haven't reread it to be accurate about this, uh, it was originally a, about an interpreter at the UN, and it was a love story. They took the book and used the premise of an interpreter at the UN, actually incorporated perhaps the first paragraph of that book, and then went on to something totally different. Uh, they made it a spy movie, which had nothing to do with Suzanne's book. What ended up happening, interestingly, is that there was a lawsuit because they did not give her credit, they did not pay her, they did not ask permission, they didn't anything. They just took the premise and basically said, well, it's anybody's premise, that kind of thing. But she uh, won in court and um, was compensated for the use of her book in the film. So you never know where a book is gonna go once it gets to the movie. Okay. <clears throat> and finally, One minute. <clears throat> okay. Uh, this is the most recent, so I saved it for last. It's unorthodox. Uh, some of you may have seen it already. It's a four-part series on Amazon. It uh, is the story, this is a memoir. So as I mentioned earlier, it's not all fiction we're talking about. And um, this young woman, Deborah Feldman grew up, was born into and grew up in a very, very extremely orthodox family. They were Satma Jews. It's an extreme religion. And she felt very confined and very uncomfortable in it. She used to sneak off to the library and read books. The education of women in this time frame and in, the, in this uh, community was very specific and very rigid and very um, simplified. So you didn't really have a picture of the broader world, but having read from the libraries, um, she realized there's a lot more out there. And at some point she decided to escape. So this is the story of her escape from this very confining religion. Now, they, uh, Amazon made a movie of it. And Wait, Fran, a... just to interrupt, so sorry. I believe it's on Netflix, not Amazon. I just double checked, oh, okay. just so I want to make you. sure. No Thank problem. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it's on Netflix and it's very worthwhile. Um, but again, it takes you in a different direction. In the book, what she does when she runs away, oh, first of all, she's uh, pregnant. Um, and in the book, she has her child, she has a little boy. And then ultimately she runs away with the little boy and she moves to Muncie, New York, 
which is also a very orthodox community, but not as extreme as the Satmar. So this is that story. She leaves Williamsburg and goes to Munsee and still in an orthodox community and finds her way or is trying to find her way to um, a personal life, uh, an independent life. If you enjoyed reading this or enjoyed the movie, there, she's written a second uh, book continuing her journey, and that's called Exodus. Uh, you may want to see where she goes from here. Now in the film, a lot of this is very accurate in terms of giving us insight into what this particular community is like. A lot of it is very ac accurate in terms of reflecting on the family and how they respond to her and, and what's going on in her life. But it goes off in a totally different direction, which is very engaging and entertaining from the perspective of viewing the film. Where, as I mentioned in uh, the book, uh, Deborah just goes to uh, upstate New York. In the film, they have her go to Germany, which is actually where she is living now but that wasn't when the book was written. And uh, in, her mother is in Germany, um, and that's a whole other ball game in terms of her parentage, and, and she was raised by a grandmother and an aunt, uh, and that they changed a little bit as well. But in the movie, they have her go to Germany to try and find her mother. She's not yet, uh, she just recently found out she was pregnant, so she does not yet have a child. And the movie goes on to share how the Satmar community and her husband are trying to get her back. She's not divorced yet. And in Germany, she finds that she's connected or she becomes involved with a, a musician, a musician, no, that's not the word, um, a conservatory of musicians. And it, it, it feels in the movie she's a pianist, and then ultimately she surprises us with another musical talent. Um, and that's ultimately how the uh, movie frames it, along with the discomfort of wondering if she's going to be brought back to her uh, home in Williamsburg. Um, in reality, she became a writer, and she is independent, and she does live with her son, and things are going well but you have a constant consciousness about who you are and who or what you may have betrayed and, and where you are in this world this minute. So both the book is very worthwhile and the movie or the series is very worthwhile. Okay, I would like to now open it up for you to share any thoughts on any of these things we Can you do it? Can you hear me? Yeah. I'd like to, I have a thought. Go ahead. Okay. While we know, as you've said, that so oftentimes authors are not happy with the final result in the movie, movies do a one- Not always, not always. Oh, that's right, not always, of course not always. But movies do a fabulous thing, two fabulous things. Number one, they give the author, in many cases, a lot of money. <laughs> and that inspires authors, seriously, to write, originally and then to write again so we get, now in addition because more people watch the movie than read the book many times their goal is to teach a lesson let's say anti-prejudice as it was in to kill a mockingbird or in south pacific more people will get that message through the movies and those are two good things that uh, evolve because we have movies to duplicate the books. Right. Absolutely. I'm not denying it. I mean, movies right, right, have it. Right. Right Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Fran? Yeah. It's Liz. I don't know. Can you see or you know who? Okay. No, I, see you. I don't see you, but I hear you. Okay. Well, thank you, darling. I, 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 oh, it's always, this was informative and I learned a lot. I'll just thank tell you, one of my favorite movies is The Age of Innocence. And when it was made into a movie, I sat once I could get it on Netflix, whatever it was on, you know, I could watch it at home. I sat with the book in front of the movie and I can vouch that the dialogue and everything. But you asked if, if it changed anything. I thought the movie seeing it gave me the visual 
you know, how they lived at that time and these mm -hmm. dinners that they had. And it enhanced. And I reread the book. I watched the movie. And I'll just ask you one question. Do you think part of the problem with the reader, when a reader sees the movie, they're anticipating the plot because you know, and then when the movie digresses from what you think, you're too busy trying to put it together to focus, <laughs> give the movie its own due. Credit, absolutely, absolutely. And that's why initially I said my, my hope is that you are aware they're two separate things. You disengage yourself from having expectations that the book will be made uh, as you envisioned it mm. and then respect <laughs> what is doing. Okay, thank you. And very, very often, dialogue direct from the book is in uh, many yes. movies. Yes, very much so. Anyone and else? Yes, we had a comment from Claire here. She said also should watch the making of Unorthodox to truly, which is another program on Netflix, to truly mm. understand how the actors felt about their roles and what they learned about the set. Fabulous oh, series. Great. If you haven't seen it, you must see it. And I, she must read the book. Yeah, I, I also agree, Claire. I need to read the book too. And I've heard great things about both the book and the, the movie. The presentation. Um, yeah. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Well, if nobody else is saying, I'll just give one more comment. You know what you said about Oprah getting the money and everything? I heard Eric Larson say that. He said, you know, Eric Larson of uh, Devil in the White City and everything. He, he was asked, how do you feel when Hollywood takes your book? And he said, you go to one side of the fence, Hollywood goes to the other. They hand you a whole lot of money and you run like hell. And exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it was Gloria Naylor, but it was the film. Okay. That was made. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like sending your kid to college. You know? Right. They don't right. come back quite the same. And and you respect the different media. You respect that they are both uniquely um, themselves. Exactly. Okay. Um, let's see what else. I I do we have another minute or no? Uh yes, yes you do. Go ahead. Okay, I just want to share um, an example of a writer who was on set and what surprised her watching her book being made into film. And this is Tracy Chevalier, and I'm sure many of us have seen The Girl with the Pearl Earring, which was another one that was really very right on the money in terms of transporting us from the book to the movie in a similar manner. She said, I didn't write Girl with the Pearl Earring expecting it to be made into a film. However, three years after its publication, I found myself in Luxembourg on a film set that had originally been built for a movie whose setting was Venice. Replace the Venetian arches with rectangular windows, spray paint on a little textured brick, and bingo, it passed for Holland. Watching it being filmed was a surreal experience. All the private ideas I'd had about the setting of my book were suddenly brutally public with cast and crew crawling all over them, measuring and moving, pulling and prodding. I kept wondering whether eventually they would pull so hard the story and characters would fall apart and I'd be caught out as a fraud. It was strange too, to see that my scribbling had spawned a whole industry of Vermeer experts. There were reproductions of his and other Dutch paintings tacked up everywhere in the production offices and books strewn about that I myself had read for research. When I first walked into the set of Vermeer's house, I Im immediately thought, no, no, this is far too big. They would never have had this kind of space. However, once I saw just how much equipment and how many people were needed to film each shot, I understood. And it goes on and on and on. Um, I'm, used to, uh, I'm used to other people transporting what I write. After all, that is what a reader does to books. I wrote Girl with a Pearl Earring for readers to interpret and make it their own. When I published it, I also let it go. I can't control what readers think or how they picture scenes and characters, nor do I want to. That was well put. So um, I wish everybody well. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we will see each other soon.
Thank you okay. so much, okay. Fran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you everyone for joining the Oceanside Library this afternoon. Thank you so much to Fran Cohen for this lovely presentation. It was awesome. A great Friday oh, afternoon presentation. Oh, was. Very thank good. You, Fran. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, thank you, Ed. You're welcome. <laughs> my, my button pusher. Yes. <laughs> All right. I'm just gonna stop the recording.